<laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, I, we are still expecting two more of our fellows, um, at least one of whom is running from class. So we'll be a little bit informal in beginning, but since we have so many speakers um, speaking briefly, I thought it wise to, to get going. Um, the, I'm Lori Lefkowitz. I direct the Humanity Center uh, here at Northeastern. And, um, and about to take a bite in the second row is Tim Cresswell, who is uh, the Associate Director of the Human... That's a special art to introduce somebody just because they're about to do that. Um, who's the Associate Director of the Humanity Center uh, and uh, does um, our Public Humanities program as well as being an Associate Dean at the college. Um, the Residential Fellowship Program of the Humanities Center is, is really the centerpiece of what we do. We sponsor all kinds of um, programs and events, as you know, regular faculty works in progress where you um, are able to hear uh, the work of your colleagues. But this is a different kind of thing. Um, it is really a gift to the participants, a gift to the director and the board. It's an opportunity to do um, what we, I think we all want to do, which is take some time to focus on our work and to have the support of our colleagues who on some level share our interest. And um, this year, the theme of the Residential Fellowship Program, uh, which always draws from various disciplines across um, the College of Social Sciences and Humanities and across the university. Um, the theme this year is by design. Uh, and what we discover is that that is a kind of lowest common denominator, and it is not a lowest common denominator. That whenever you um, pick a theme like that, you, you, you watch the subject itself expand before your eyes. It's a kind of magic. Um, over the, this is a very long conversation. It is a conversation over the course of the full year. We have spent, um, since the beginning of the semester, just defining for one another what each of us means by design. We've been sharing some readings. We've been listening to introductions to what each of the projects of our fellows um, is. And um, we have structured a year of programming that mirrors and matches, uh, public programming, that is what you're here for today, that mirrors and matches what we have been doing. So today is a round table. Everybody's going to give you a little flash of what they're working on. And then uh, this cheat sheet is very important. Um, over the course of, because I will not read everybody's bio, it would take too much of the uh, precious time that we have, but um, the fellows are chosen in a competitive process. Um, I assure you, these are your very uh, successful, smart, and distinguished colleagues, and I do encourage you to read their biographies. Um, but over the course of the year, December 7th, uh, February 8th, and March 14th, um, in groups of three and four, the uh, fellows will present their work in more detail. Today is a teaser. This is the trailer. This is the appetizer. I grew up in the restaurant business. I learned that you put pickles on the table to whet people's appetites. This is that, you know. Um, also, to make them thirsty because drinks are the most, um, uh, the most profitable part of, um, of, of the business. So uh, I want to tell you as well that um, I, I'm just going to read the description, or uh, briefly from the description of the call, where we said the appearance of design, fine detail, intricate patterning, evidence of planning is ubiquitous in nature and culture. This year's a Northeastern Humanity Center fellows present <laughs> projects that are concerned with aspects of design, ornamentation, utility, aesthetics, creativity, emotion, rationality, and intention, as well as projects that theorize and quest question principles of design. And as we listened to one another talk, what we discovered are loosely three subgroups um, that are organizing the subsequent um, occasions that we will, publication occasions that we have, and will organize, uh, simply organize the order of speakers today. Um, the first is on education and design. 
and um, for education and design. Uh, Victoria King would have been first. She's homesick, but I will tell you what her topic is, what she's working on. Worth a Thousand Words, Photography, Technology, and Making of Modern Education. Um, Matthias Felison will speak first on how to design programs, and next will be Stuart Peter Freud, whose uh, project is called From Natural Theology to Irreducible Complexity, the way of the argument from design after the, the way of the argument from design after Darwin. And I'll get up and tell you about the next four and the next three, um, just as a way of punctuating our panel discussion. Um, finally, I want to say that uh, the call for applications is announced early in this, uh, well, I guess earlier than that. We'll be sending out a call for applications um, you know, end of this semester, perhaps early spring, uh, faculty and graduate students are invited to apply. Our theme for next year, which has just been decided, is inclusions and exclusions, and we will develop a little description about that. And I have my mind, uh, my eye on the following year to have a theme about the stories we tell. So um, just so you can be thinking about what you want to do. Um, and without further ado, uh, Matthias, why don't you get us rolling? I will. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I can't sit down when I speak about my stuff. I'm too excited. So and I, I'm the open now too. I'm in computer science. How can I be really mad at that? All right. So let me throw you off with another question to the audience. Do you know, if you're American, that a single fact in middle school determines your salary at the mid 30s, Mithadas, Mithadas, your profession. One fact. What is that? Ten minutes like. This one fact is how well you can do with word problems and turn it into algebraic expressions and functions. And the US DOED has known this for decades. There have had longitudinal studies in the 70s and 90s, and they have known that, and we try to work on this. And so it's the best thing you can do for kids is work on stuff like that. How do I relate? Okay. How do I relate is roughly this, this smooth curve on the left side here up on the screen. That's my aspiration and my history. And it starts with a little red dot in the middle. It's me around 94, 93, teaching at Rice University. I was there for like 15 years. Uh, the freshman course in computer science. I volunteered for professor or whatever. Well, in this course, and I had, a, I had an insight that was devastating. We're horrible teachers, all of us, not just me. Uh, and we're horrible teachers because we teach a mimic me approach, especially in, in, in this area that just mentioned this idea of attacking world problems and, and turning them into some, some artifact. It doesn't have to be math, it could be something else. What we do is we stand up there and we give an example and we tell the students to copy it. We make a slight, a slight variation of the example and they say, go, solve it. And then as, the, as time goes on, we make slightly bigger differences be between what we do and what they're supposed to do and we hope for the best. That's it. And you see this in computer science teaching, you see this in math teaching, you see this in many, many disciplines that teach like that. And so I decided that I had enough of that. And I also realized that what I was worried about started in middle school and went all the way through college. And so I, what I wanted to create was a smooth curve of approaching problems, freelance problems in middle school, I about textbooks, all the way to pages and pages of specifications for a big program that some middler at Northeastern is supposed to write. Right? When I say a big program, we're talking about 10,000 lines of code, 15,000 lines of code. It's basically a book. And it starts out with a 20 page or 10 pages. <coughs> and the same problem, meta problem, is, is something that the middle school algebra student faces. And I believe that by systematically teaching how to approach problems, by designing an approach, by having a design or an approach to these problems, we can do much better. What does it look like for middle school students? Usually middle school students, I had two sons going to middle schools, I watched hundreds of kids just sitting there watching them. 
and it's, it's devastating because you see frustration. You see the anger going up. And you see why kids fail at the task. What it means is when you give them this design or an approach, you have two effects. The major effect in my mind is you empower them to go through this stuff and have a feeling of success. Because they know there are, there are steps to this problem, there are steps to the solution, and that when they're stuck, they can go to cheat sheet. And regardless of problem, they can look up how to, what to do now. And the side effect is a wonderful side effect. You no longer calculate on paper and pencil when the horse buggy that leaves Boston at three miles an hour at nine o'clock in the morning arrives in Worcester, you actually make a scene where it hobbles around from Boston to Worcester and it's the same amount of work. And what we found, for example, by reaching out to middle school projects in 94 is that in I made it plain in Massachusetts, uh, if you know about the MCAS, with lots of kids in the MCAS going through this approach, they can now succeed where they failed before. We have teachers calling us that say, why did you feed those kids? They passed the test, they had F's in math. And you can take this approach very smoothly, that's my hope, it's not true, all the way to the South Atlantic thing. I show a smooth curve. It's not really smooth, at the moment it's a step function. A little step, discrete steps, but we're getting there. So this is for me a project that has taken 20 years of my life. I'm hoping to spend another 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years, Look, I'm good. Uh, on, on, on this stuff. And this year here is for me, this one year, engaging with other disciplines, is for me a chance to work a little bit on the hypothesis that have, has emerged from my work in the last few years. So the hypothesis is that this design oriented working and thinking <coughs> resonates with concepts and ideas that my colleagues here also think about and work on. Whether that works out, I don't know. But this is for me a year of passing through a different world. I always go and I always challenge myself. When I don't like something, I study it really hard. When I feel estranged, I go over there and figure out what it's like. I always put myself in the mind of the other guy. That's the goal. That's my year here. And so I want to conclude with one element of design. What by design. So what, what is the point of thinking of by design? Right? That's the graph on the right. And it comes with a quote from one of my colleagues here, who was in other readings that said, design is a plan for arranging elements in such a way as to achieve a particular purpose. So I also I already learned something in the first couple of months of being with my friends here in different worlds. What does that mean? So I hear what's it mean from my world. What's the difference by design and by intent? Okay. Design comes with a plan and a purpose. So if you look at this little graph at the bottom, it's not scary, it's not math, it's just a little box. It says different idea, right? And you, what, the idea is you create an artifact. And I use the word artifact because I don't want to use a product, I don't want it because it could be something soft, and a thought it could be a poet, poem, it could be a piece of software which you can never touch. It could be an actual thing like a chair. But you have this idea of creating something. And what design already means is that you have a plan, a method that is uniform and helps you along so you can focus on the creative act, the creative aspect of the artifact. That's the, that's the plan part. What's the purpose part about it? Purpose means that you constantly evaluate. It's called formative evaluation in the, in the educational world. You constantly evaluate whether you're getting there. Do you actually, are you, are you on track to get to this purpose that you want? And then you have to be ready for one more step. I call it, educational world calls it summative evaluation. Summative evaluation means that somebody must take your artifact and bang it, repurpose it, reset it somewhere, maybe even break it. Okay, and you can take that result of this evaluation after the artifact is out there as something you take for the next time when you start again. So you have a loop going on inside this red box, which is of evaluating and feeding back to the process. But there's also this meta feedback loop that goes back for the next step. Think of a poet. A poet has a form for poetry. But it's not creative, but that's the scaffolding that you get from design or the process. Now you fill it with creative content. You formatively evaluate what's going on. That's the poet. Now the poet throws the poem over the wall. What do you do? 
you as a critic or an analyst, you take it apart. You, re you bend it. You repurpose it. You break it. You break the intention behind it. That's design. Okay? You can think of it as politics. You can judge a politician by good intentions. Or you can judge a politician by good deeds. Evaluate what's actually going on. What did she promise before she ran? What did he do after he became a politician and active? Right? It's two different things. Judging by intention, judging by yourself. That's my goal. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Peter Freud. <laughs> well, I didn't know I was doing a prequel today, but since I am, I think I will subtitle my um, project, which is called Intelligent Design and Return of IntelliKey, uh, as the empiricist rises. Um, but, no. Um, one of the things that I got my attention, having completed a study of natural theology from Bacon and Darwin, published it several years ago, um, is the intractability in the face of modern science of the argument from design and staying power. And um, Excuse me, I'm not feeling all that long. Um, the argument persists, and the question is above and beyond the obvious motivations like religious commitment. You know, is there something in the nature of argument itself that causes this persistence? And what I've settled on is that language in its temporal unfolding can be read as, or perhaps mistaken for, I'm not sure what the final conclusion is going to be, an entelechy. Entelechy is a concept we have from Aristotle. It's the working through the causes. It's the become, It's a way of accounting for the becomingness of something. <coughs> so to go back to the beginning with Darwin, or excuse me, with Bacon, what Bacon does is, you know, he takes on animals because he's taking on Aristotle on his own turf and says, no, 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 no. You know, the way you deal with animals is by close empirical observation. You don't collect anecdotes about them. And no sooner has he made this position clear than he goes back to Aristotle and Aristotle's causes when he comments in Valerius Terminus on the fact that um, we can know the form, but not the face of the maker. The maker is generally Aristotle's metaphor for the formal cause in the chain that goes from lowest to highest, material, formal, efficient, final. Um, and even Darwin, um, you know, seems in some ways to hew very closely, dangerously closely to Intelligent arguments. Uh, for example, his discussion of homology. Do we have the slide up? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Homology uh, specifies that you know a given anatomical part, say the forelimb of the vertebrate uh, phylum, uh, is adapted for function given the medium of the in which the phylum or the phylum uh, is active. So for example, uh, you know, bats fly, so uh, their forelimbs mutate to become wings, whales swim, their forelimbs mutate to become flippers. Um, and you know, we can look at other species and see how the evolution of structure follows uh, some kind of uh, maximization of efficiency. Um, what I've realized when I was trying to think about what the hell I was going to say for five minutes today um, is that in some ways I'm, I'm back on very familiar territory. Uh, my position is somewhere in the same neighborhood of someone like Marcuse, a one-dimensional man, uh, given especially his critique of operationalist science 
you know, one doesn't simply do science, one does science by making some a priori assumptions. <coughs> they can be axiomatic. So, for example, even something as supposedly transparent and self-evident as Euclid's elements is prefaced by 17 axioms, uh, without which the geometrical proofs that follow don't make any sense. So, you know, what I'm going to do is just leave this as a problem that I'm working on because I'm not sure what the answer to the problem or the question is going to be. But is there any way to make the transition from reading Darwin to the operationalizing of Darwin in life sciences that can, in some ways, evade or skirt or neutralize the question of the origins of design. And part of the problem I've come up with is that I think the very temporality of language uh, has the potential to create what I'm going to, for lack of a better term, call an incestuous relationship between temporality and causation. Uh, you know, it may be that things really don't happen the way we write them out as occurring. But once we've written them out, doing that has consequences. Uh, you know, one of the things that I point out in my <clears throat> inaugural considerations is that having made his argument uh, about evolution, Darwin gives it all back at the end in the Tangle Bank analogy, in which uh, he observes that you know, there is such a thing as a creator and it's breathed life into one or several forms. You know, we're back at Genesis 2-7. You know, can we get out of that circle? I mean, that's, that's the question I'm posing and I hope to come up with a more coherent answer as I go forward. Thanks. Thank you. I, I hope this is whetting your appetite for uh, for more elaborated um, presentations. And um, uh, well, um, the next so these these uh, two and, and Victoria is working on textbooks, by the way, photography and textbooks. The next grouping are um, professors uh, Elizabeth Bukar. She's in philosophy and religion. She will speak to us about pious fashion, followed immediately by. Emily Cummins, who is a PhD candidate in sociology and anthropology, whose project is on designing uncertain futures, building home and unhomely in Detroit. Uh, Benedict Jimenez, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, whose um, project is called Inequality by Design. And Charlie Lesh, who is um, a PhD candidate in the English department, who is uh, working on the spatial rhetorical function of, wait for it, graffiti writing in Boston, <laughs> Massachusetts. We we'll talk about Charlie's IRB and how hard it is to go and do the legal acts. Um, so my project is Pious Fashion. This is one of those projects that has developed by mistake out of other stuff I was doing. So I do comparative religious ethics. I work in Christianity Islam on issues of gender and sexuality. And if you work on Islam and women, you, you kind of don't want to work on the veil. You get asked about the veil a lot, you have to teach on the veil, you're sick of the veil. The veil is not actually that interesting within Islamic studies, it's only interesting as a reflection about the West obsession with the other. That being said, I got asked to write introductory sort of like general audience book about the veil, and I had a really good time trying to think about different ways to complicate the issue, and my favorite chapter was this chapter I wrote on fashion, and I had done you know, all this fieldwork at that point um, in Iran and, and in Turkey to some extent. And when I started thinking about it, I was like, yeah, actually modesty looks really different in Turkey and Iran. I did about a month in Indonesia, and I was like, why is the people wearing this tight stuff, which would be get you arrested in Iran as sort of their um, uh, their choice of, of, of what um, the local hijab would look like. And so I sort of started thinking that, okay, actually, I do want to work on this issue a little bit more. So again, this is my, um, out of resistance came this, this project. Um, I'm in the urban, where are we going again? The urban spaces group, instead of the creativity group, partly because I asked to be, um, but also partly because the, the three locations I'm looking at are all urban spaces. I'm working, it's a comparative study between um, Tehran, Iran, um, 
Istanbul, Turkey, and Georgia, Indonesia. Um, and so part of the way women present themselves has to do with a particular like, urban aesthetic. Um, so for the mom, a Muslim woman who dresses modestly and wears the latest clothing styles, piety entails substantial design skills. That was my pitch for why I should be part of this group. They're thinking about design all the time. They need to know which base layers to wear underneath their headscarf to that are flattering to their face. There's all this great stuff in Indonesia and advice literature about cutting your face here if your cheeks are too big or cutting your face here if your forehead's too big to make, to give a more attractive um, presentation to the world. Uh, she plays with colors and textures to complement her skin tone. She mixes and matches off-the-rack clothing to create unique yet on-trend look. And when necessary, she creates new forms of hijab to incorporate fashion trends or lifestyle. There's a new style um, in Iran, for example, that's only really become popular in the last five, not even ten years, five years, which is called Arab Chador, which um, was sort of a, a, an invention of basically sleeves into the, the traditional form of Chador. That's not this is yet. I'll just talk about this slide in a second. So in my current book project, Pies Fashion, I'm exploring the ethical implications of these fashion skills through a comparative study of women's, a Muslim women's sectoral practices in those three urban spaces. And I argue that through specific clothing choices, Muslim women are leveraging the attention that the public, the public puts on the presentation of their bodies, the attention we pay to women's, Muslim women's bodies in particular. And they're leveraging this attention to become important um, creators, arbiters, and critics of local norms and values. So for the humanity-centered design by design theme of the year, my Muslim fashionistas raise a number of important questions, such as what motivates design questions and innovations in clothing? What are the unintended consequences of new forms of modest dress? Are there moments of rationality within seemingly irrational sartorial practices, like just looking pretty? Um, what does it, in what ways does design have tangible political, epistemological, and theological effects? You can see some of the design decisions actually pushing back in these different areas, both politics and ethics and theology. And what's the relationship between aesthetics and ethics, which Theo is helping me work out. <laughs> um, I should probably talk a little bit about my design, my method, my design of my projects and fair design group. So this um, work is drawing on ethnographic research in those three areas. Um, so I did a couple of stints in all of them, um, re reviewing local print media as well and some primary religious sources. Um, and in those three contexts, I'm doing everything from like interviewing tastemakers like designers to doing focus groups with women to um, spending days with women and seeing which um, women they're slut shaming and calling their hijab slutty, um, photographing, you know, sort of a wide range of things that I'm doing in those contexts. And the three case studies, they may seem kind of arbitrary, but um, I picked them for a reason. They're all Muslim majority contexts, so the assumption is that the reader or the viewer is also a Muslim, the person who is seeing the woman in her dress. Um, but they're also selected with an eye towards decentering Arab cultures and narratives as sort of our assumption that those are what ground all um, Islamic norms. So a lot of the work about um, Islamic women in general, particularly the veil, sort of assumes not only the Middle East, but also this sort of um, Cairo narrative of like what the invention of women's dress and the change of fashion trends looks like. Um, and so trying to like look at Muslim majority contexts that are not Arab. Um, and there are, of course, very different contexts, right? So Iran, you have a compulsory, you have to wear the veil in Iran. I have to wear the veil in Iran, it's legally required. Um, but even before the 1979 revolution, it becomes a contested um, practice where the Shah forbids it. It becomes a pawn, basically, throughout the 20th century. Um, and then in Indonesia, actually, even though it's the majority Muslim country, huge Muslim population, biggest Muslim population in the world, it's not a place where people wear headscarves, really, at all. Um, it wasn't a place that Muslim women ever wore really headscarves. Um, until after Sahatra, and it was seen as sort of a way to rebel against that particular regime. And now it's so popular that a lot of, well, girls don't admit this directly, but they say they have friends who wear it just as a fashion um, symbol. So we'll just wear a headscarf on Friday to go out to a club or a coffee shop as a sort of symbol of them being on trend. So big change in Indonesia in the last 10, 15 years. And in Turkey, women's dress was, has often been tied to anxieties over potential threat of political Islam. So again, banned in certain university settings, and now it's really on the uptick, particularly with the new politics, and um, a lot of production is done in Turkey as well. So we have really different and interesting and very complex contexts like that. So basically, my, my um, project is about three things matter. Clothing matters, women matter, and pretty things matter. Um, and so this is my slide. Actually, it's not really cut off as much as it looks like it is. It's from an Iranian Tumblr. There's this um, 
guy who always been curating sort of design, um, street fashion, as he says, and he takes a woman and takes a picture of her from different angles and posts her. Um, and this is an example of something I've actually seen all three contexts that it's new in the last um, five, maybe ten years in some of the contexts, which is this ethnic chic, which is it it it, it shows up in all the um, all three contexts very differently. Um, it plays on local production of cloth, so in Indonesia it plays on batik, as batik is getting the um, uh, celebrated as um, an Indonesian indigenous sort of cloth production. Um, it also pulls in weaving and hand embroidery. Um, like I said, it's found in different forms. This is um, this sort of like tie-dye indigo. This is an Iranian um, case, but in the Iranian case you also see a lot of Kurdish textiles being incorporated, which were never seen until quite recently, and partly that's interesting because they use a lot of red and green, which are very, um, the colors themselves have a lot of symbolism in Islam. Um, and it went from sort of the bizarre people bringing in um, textiles from outside of Tehran to now it's in all the boutiques and things like that. So this style is interesting because it doesn't, and some of the styles I'm looking at are kind of po um, pushing on modesty boundaries through exposure of skin and body. That, this doesn't do this, right? And so in some ways it meets the aesthetic goals set by the religious experts. So in Iran, this concern with like not showing a woman's shape at all and covering her skin. Um, I mean, only the ankles are really showing here in the wrist. So it's, it's pretty modest in terms of those. It's, it's, it's living up to the expectations of the religious experts in Iran, the moralities police, and other powerful actors. But there's something potentially subversive about this because it's clothing that's privileging a Persian, an Asian, and a Turkish aesthetic of ethnic cloth over against an Islamic and an Arab one. Um, which, which in, in Iran is actually has some really important political sort of ramifications. So, I think I'm gonna stick to my five minutes. So, there, that's my five fashion project. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so this might seem kind of like a strange choice for an image, um, but kind of at the broadest level, my project is about design, transformation, and redevelopment of the built environment. And so demolition is one quite powerful way of transforming that space, and particularly in Detroit, one particularly contested way. So more specifically, my project explores the politics and practices of development projects meant to revitalize Detroit in the aftermath of the largest municipal bankruptcy in U.S. history. Um, so based on 12 months of ethnographic field work, which I did last academic year, so in-depth interviews, participant observation, participation with housing advocates, all of these sorts of things, um, my research kind of explores how desires and designs for a future city have shaped the politics of development in Detroit and how discourses of a future city reconfigure historically racialized geographies. So design plans as technical documents or architectural renderings are ways of thinking about the city and its future that circulate through the physical environment. So I think of design as working through urban spaces when it's leveraged by different actors who create plans or ideas that are intended to change urban space in some way. And so in this way, I'm kind of studying the literal ground where development initiatives are aimed, the subjects in their purview, and the actors empowered to circulate or enact design in different ways. And of course, people are differently empowered to do so. So in or kind of on this space, um, the design of buildings involved negotiations among different actors with different stakes, which is a process that's often very fraught. So the built environment and its shape and its in design articulates with our social world, and that's where it kind of becomes a site that's very political, and also a site where people kind of construct and make meaning out of their lives. So in particular, I study housing and the home as a site of contestation over imagining a different Detroit, where plans for the redevelopment of neighborhoods, demolition of neighborhoods sort of collide with plans for luxury building in certain spaces of the city. And so I kind of conceive of design as both an active process of creating and changing things in the built environment, um, but also as kind of a speculative and an imaginative process where these sort of architectural dreams collide with very racialized processes of re eviction and removal. So housing and home is, is a material and a political crisis, but also part of a subjective sense of feeling like you belong or don't belong to a redeveloping city and what place you might have in either now or at some point in the future. And so interviews I did with, especially with victims of foreclosure and eviction, this sort of ideas about the futures and narratives about disbelonging to the future sort of figured really prominently, um, as well as sort of what home means to people in, in a physical sense, but also sort of in a more abstract sense of 
belonging to a city. And so place in the kind of physical sense matters really considerably. Tim Ingold's contention that landscape tells, or rather is a story, I think is useful here as he kind of attends to the ways in which physical landscapes are felt by in his terminology dwellers, but people who are in the space, people who sort of feel it and live it. And so landscape stories are inscribed in people's in, in places. And so these landscape stories are an important part of my project and sort of collecting these narratives was a big part of the field work that I did. Um, and so futures are part of an ongoing landscape, and so they unfold within the already existing landscape. So stories of the future are sort of always part of our landscape stories. So there is a kind of privilege in being able to think about the future and to project yourself into it in different ways. So I think temporality is important here. And so all of this kind of future making stands in contrast to a kind of presentisme, as the historian Francois Hartog has called it, which is to kind of say this moment where the the lines between past and present and future are blurred. It's sort of a, a space for the precariat, as he called it. You're sort of su suspended, um, and the future, in a sense, is foreclosed or sort of disappears in different ways. And he sort of talks about this with figures like refugees and immigrants and sort of those we think as the most precariat. But I think a lot of this applies to the sort of organized <coughs> urban in Detroit, the sort of surplus urban. Um, so in a way, it's a, it's a kind of a lack of mobility. Um, so design or kind of the idea or the ability to change what a space means or will look like means something very different to architects or planners or sort of authors of redevelopment plans than it does to residents who sort of feel like their physical space is kind of pulled out from underneath them in a way or demolished very spectacularly in front of them in different ways. Um, so also sort of the last piece of this is that I kind of study um, social movements or urban social movements where the sort of redesigning the city space in certain ways opens up a site for more radical politics, um, especially for housing advocates who kind of seize on certain critiques of particular futures to point out how these exclusions are sort of being reformulated and to sort of point out who is being written out of plans for a future city. And so they sort of draw attention to the struggles that have yet to be fought today in an effort to make a Detroit a more livable city for the majority of residents. Um, and so this is where activists understand the built environment as very central to their concerns and sort of they understand how global processes shape their experiences kind of locally. And in particular, I'm sort of talking about the design and implementation of financial in inst instruments like bad mortgages. Um, and the sort of transnational property speculation that works through the built environment that has had that has really drove the infrastructure and in particular the housing crisis in Detroit. So urban planning in its sort of technical or anti-politics approach, as some people have called it, sort of allies these ideas of social position and social privilege. The future in, in this rendering is just an open sort of blank space, the next frontier. Um, but as we know, that's not exactly how it works in Detroit or anywhere. For that matter. So, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for being here today. Of course, free lunch, right? <laughs> uh, my project title of the research is Inequality by Design. I think there's a subtitle there. It's a distribution of wealth, poverty, and public services in a fragmented metropolis. So when we talk about fragmentation in, in the metropolitan area, we're talking about the number of local governments that we have. For example, here in the US, we have many types of local governments, counties, municipalities, townships, towns, school districts, special districts, and many other special types of governments. So when you have many of these types of governments in your region, your region is classified as fragmented. And for some, that is by design, and that's good design, especially for some economists and political scientists. They argue that when you have this kind of a fragmented local governance system, uh, it can promote efficiency in economic terms. What does this mean? It means that as a home buyer, you have a choice where you want to reside in, right? uh, depending on your preferences for how much property tax you want to pay, the kinds of services that you value the most. So you can choose from many different jurisdictions. Right? So in economic terms, 
this market-like arrangement, the fragmented metropolis, enhances your welfare. It's like a shopping mall. You have different choices as to vendors selling the goods that you are or that you prefer. Some, however, argue that when you have a local governance system <coughs> designed with this market perspective, something can go wrong. Right? Something will always go wrong when you think like an economist, right? Are there any economists here? <laughs> when you choose where to live, right, it's not really just about the tax and service package that you prefer, that you decide. Sometimes it can be about your choice of what kind of people you want to be with in that neighborhood. Sometimes it can be about skin color, sometimes it can be about social class, right? You want to be with people who look the same as you do and who earn the same as you do. Now, this process of population sorting according to social class and race can actually harm the welfare of some individuals, right? In essence, when you have these lifestyle choices informing population sorting, what you will observe in a metropolitan area are jurisdictions where you have a lot of wealthy people, and then jurisdictions where you have a lot of very poor people, right? Now, why is, is that a problem? It's a problem because naturally when you live in a very poor jurisdiction, that government there will not have the necessary resources to provide the services needed by its residents. So in that way, this kind of market-like arrangement harms the poor, as in, in any market, right? If you're poor, the market couldn't care less for you. So when you think of a local government system as a market-like arrangement, this is the consequence. Some will be left out. So it's inequality by design, a question mark. Right? So what my research tries to do is, what has happened to these poor communities in highly fragmented regions, what has happened to them since the Great Recession of 2007-2009? So we, we don't really have a lot of data on that. Right? Uh, what types of services were cut here? Did they cut social services, education services, what? Right? And what is the outcome? How has this cut? affected the residents in those areas? What revenues are available to these poor com communities? Are state and federal governments doing something to help them? And the research design for these studies is largely quantitative, uh, very different from my colleagues here, and it involves municipal governments across the US, and the data sources are, of course, the government-sponsored census of governments and the decennial census. So I will end with that and give it to my colleague here. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize that we don't have two screens. This has been an ongoing problem this year in this room. Um, so my image is the um, outside of the bathroom stall uh, in the Harvard Square neighborhood of Cambridge. I felt confident I would be the only person with an image of a bathroom here today. Um, Where's the bathroom? Where's that? So uh, the bathroom is a fairly well-known uh, spot for graffiti writing in that the owner has essentially ceased buffing it, um, buffing or the removal of the writing. So in, its, in essence, redesigning the space um, as a space for writing, along with all the other standard activities that occur in bathrooms. So I want to start off with a brief <laughs> overview of my project, um, and then I want to end with a few central ideas of my thinking in relationship to design. Um, so the writing studies component of, so I study composition and rhetoric in the English department, and the writing studies component of my project is um, thinking of what I'm calling the spatiality of genre. So the ways in which genres of writing can produce um, real and imagined social spaces. Um, so I want to think of genre not as ossified elements of a text, 
sanitation, introduction, all these things, uh, but as spatially productive social action. So I want to think of graffiti as producing spaces, different types of spaces throughout the cityscape. Um, to get to these types of questions, um, I've designed uh, ethnographic methodology uh, sensitive to the already existing circulation of text within uh, communities of graffiti writers. So um, like a lot of ethnography, ethnography, it's difficult to really pinpoint when it started, and it's still very much ongoing. Um, but in a roughly 18-month period, I've conducted interviews um, with retired and active graffiti writers from the Boston area. Um, I've explored the city, um, all parts of the city, and taken photos. Um, I've circulated a black book, which is a type of community sketchbook um, within graffiti, uh, communities of graffiti writers. And I've worked as a participant observer. Um, so take an extensive field notes. And um, in this type of study, I've really become kind of acutely aware to the role that design playing and the types of things that design thinking can um, contribute to my project. So design thinking is, attra design thinking is attractive to me um, because it allows me to more fully articulate the rhetorical function of graffiti writing in designed urban spaces, so the way it's interacting with the spaces um, in which it's producing. So as a resistive writing practice, or what I would call a resistive writing practice, I want to argue in my work uh, that graffiti writing interacts with design spaces in politically uh, meaningful ways. Um, one of the readings and one of the definitions we've kind of tossed around of design, which Matthias actually alludes to earlier, is, quote, a plan for arranging elements in such a way as to best accomplish a particular purpose. And I think this is a really useful, if slightly incomplete, formulation of what design is, because I don't think and I don't want in my work for design thinking to cease at the level of production, so design. Um, but I'd rather include the ways in which users of the systems that have been designed interact with those systems. And Jillian's work touches on this certainly. So I think of Desartaux walking through the city and mentally remapping it as a useful formulation here. Um, I'm interested in my work in how individuals engage in rhetorical activities like writing um, that resist or draw attention to design, um, draw attention to the condition of spaces having been designed of particular systems, spaces, institutions, etc. So, and I want to kind of conclude with a couple of key points on design. So in relation to design, my project argues that graffiti writing operates on really three levels. Uh, one is that graffiti, as a hot, heavily stylized rhetorical object, um, is designed itself. It's a compilation of elements intended to produce <coughs> some effect. So that's the sort of rhetoricality of graffiti writing. Um, I also want to argue that graffiti writing interferes with other designs by reclaiming spaces for different purposes. So obviously the bathroom being a key example of this, or one key example of this. In this way it works as much as a redesign as design, in that graffiti writing necessarily exists in spaces having already been designed for other means. Right? So you talk to a lot of graffiti writers, and they argue that graffiti in spaces that allow it is not actually graffiti at all, it's something different, right? It has to be in a space that it's not intended for, which made IRB a little tricky. Um, <laughs> um, and the third point, and this one is the one I've really been thinking about um, a lot lately, and I think it's in some ways the trickiest, is that graffiti writing is able to draw attention to the fact that the spaces in which it exists are designed for other purposes. Um, drawing attention to the material and imagined designedness of urban spaces. Um, so I'm thinking um, a lot about what we talk, or a lot of disciplines def uh, define good design as design that it kind of erases the markers of its own production, design that you forget was designed. So we can only have to watch like an Apple event talking about the iPhone as an extension of the body mm -hmm. to really understand this, right? Um, I'm interested in writing that dis disrupts that naturalness of design. Uh, writing that makes us very aware of the social behaviors and actions that are um, intended to exist in particular spaces. So design, disrupt, design disruption. Um, so I think I'm going to end it there, because I can keep going on and on, but I'm going to try really hard to stay to five minutes. So that's where I'm thinking, and thank you all for coming. So we have three uh, more short presentations, and then I hope we'll have that 15 minutes to engage um, the rest of you with our larger conversation. The last three speakers are, um, I mean, loosely their projects um, uh, are about creativity, creation and design, aesthetics, and play um, in relation to design. 
Uh, the first is um, Associate Professor Theo Davis in the Department of English, whose project is called Determinism and Unpredictability in Naturalist Fiction. Then Andrea Parker, who is an assistant professor um, in the College of Computer and Information Science, and in Bouvet, whose project is called Designing for the Qualified Self, if I'm blocking you. <laughs> With apologies. And finally, Jillian Smith, who is in the College of Arts, Media, and Design, an associate professor, and her and in computer and information science. We have a lot of these uh, cross college um, fellows here. And her and Jillian's uh, project is called Understanding the History of Generative Design, Uncovering Themes in Procedural Content and Generative Methods Across Media. Yes, <laughs> 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 yeah, give us a little. Oh, it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, Theo. Yes. Um, so I just want to start by saying that the piece I wrote for today, is, it, it starts talking a little bit about my ideas about naturalism. It's my proposal for the seminar is to develop a project on naturalism, which is uh, a form of American literature. And then I kind of expand it more broadly, and I do talk about some other work that I'm engaged in, because the real interest for me of the project I proposed is as an opportunity to think in some very broad terms about the way that the humanities um, have tended to operate in the past several decades. And I'm kind of working on developing, uh, I don't know if I, I actually sort of don't want to use the term methodology, but maybe a voice that's appropriate for a different kind of critical writing that I'm trying to develop at this point in my career. It does, however, pick up on the, the reality that in both of my previous um, book projects, the question of not what it means to read or what it has to mean to experience the text, but what it can mean um, and how people have thought about the value and uh, specificity of certain ways of engaging text. Um, that's always been a really important concern of mine. It's why I tend to write about criticism more than most critics do. Um, and I'm still, in some ways, pursuing that same question in the work I'll talk about today. So on a surface level, naturalist fiction, a late 19th century offshoot of realism, is preoccupied by theories of social, environmental, and biological determinism in which persons are seen as unwitting results of the conditions into which they are born. This would not count as designed in the strong sense of an intentional agent controlling their lives' outcomes, but in the novels, the world is over and over presented as having a structure in which both historical and natural factors interlock to control and thus design characters' fates, such that individual choice and the ability to shape alike are presented as largely fantastical or absurd notions. Such novels are, however, equally preoccupied with ways in which persons are capable of unanticipated and surprising actions and transformations, um, although these usually seem uh, random or anomalous rather than intentional. The result is a peculiar combination of sort of illogical and unpredictable events and the sense of overall dominating structures and uh, control. Not surprisingly, given this kind of odd setup of naturalism, some of the critical discussions about naturalism have been really central um, orienting ones for the whole field of uh, studying American literary criticism, particularly the way that we have been trained to think about literature in relationship to what one might call the social real. Um, for example, there's a major early work of historic criticism by Walter Ben Michaels, which avowed through its reading of naturalism that literature should be understood as nothing other than a part of the culture which it participates in. It doesn't comment on it, it doesn't change it or influence it, it is one among many other manifestations of it. And this is um, actually, it, it's kind of a crucial and influential claim that literature doesn't have a special status outside of culture, but only is really of interest for being one among many other articulations and expressions of underlying uh, logics, which is actually a critical phrase for Michaels' book. It's about not naturalism as literature, but the logic of naturalism, and that's a logic that he extends to um, you know, thinking about economic policy um, uh, and 
and uh, social policy and historical conditions more broadly. Now, I will say that much of the genius and force of much of the work in the humanities that drew me into it, um, in which I was trained, focuses on this gesture of locating a hidden or structuring logic often equated to a cultural meaning behind text. And this can be a kind of magical interpretive move. Um, if you've ever read Foucault, you've seen it, you know, kind of at its height, where you take a tremendous array of phenomena of many different forms from a culture and rearrange them in such a way that you can say, here's the essence beneath it. And this is the kind of structuring thing from, you know, the panopticon. Never built, but it's the essential structure on which all of modernity is built. And it's like, Ah, we've done it. <laughs> so, however, this kind of reading process, and you know, central to Foucault, but in my discipline, naturalism is a central site for this kind of work's uh, genesis, really. Um, however, this uncovering of hidden logics or designing principles has struck some critics as less urgent in the past years, um, and yet it's unclear what can replace it with anything like that power. Uh, personally, I would tend to caution against the urge to turn criticism into a project of what is called surface reading. You can tell by my tone when I think of that. Um, <laughs> or is the analysis of textual and historical objects in ways that cast off the engagement with the text themselves, suggesting they're obvious of what they mean is written right on the surface, and in some way they can just be assembled or presented um, and known as objects that don't demand some kind of deeper um, some deeper kind of interpretive work. That seems like the wrong response to this feeling that we've had enough Foucault, now we can just say, huh, there's a detective novel, nice. Um, <laughs> thing, I actually think that it's an, interesting, it's an interesting kind of claim made by the critic Jonathan Crary. Um, he repeats it in an early polemical book, 24-7. One of the things that he says here, and this is a quote, we are now in an era in which there's an overarching prohibition on wishes other than those linked to individual acquisition, accumulation, and power. Now, I know taking out of context might be like, really, like, good for him, but if you take up this notion that he puts forth that there's a kind of urgency in, in this particular cultural moment to say, somehow there's a, a restriction, or an increasing limitation on, as he puts it, what kind of wishes are accepted in this culture? What I find interesting about that is it suggests that there's a kind of need to focus on the terrain of individual activity. Even for him, it's a very important notion, how one's life is actually spent in the moment as a zone of kind of um, politicized battle, I would say. He goes on to say, this is another quote, the range of what constitutes response becomes formulaic and is in most instances reduced to a small inventory of possible gestures or choices. And here's just to give an example, he says, because one's bank account and one's friendships can now be managed through the identical machinic operations and gestures, which is the use of your laptop, there's a growing homogenization of what used to be entirely unrelated areas of experience. And I know it's a lot to just hear him like randomly announce, but it's kind of a powerful claim that he's making against uh, what he calls the digital era, which is that there is a kind of feeding of all of our experience through um, these technological devices that in some ways operate on a very limited set of physical gestures, for instance, you could say for him, but also conceptual gestures to some degree. The sense of everything is working through, in his argument, an increasingly homogenized world. What I take from this is a really broad suggestion that there's a kind of need in this culture less for a critique of the underlying meaning of historical formations and more for the expansion of a repertoire of ways of responding to life and even of moving in sensitive and creative ways in relationship to the different phenomena we encounter in our time. It's a kind of shift from saying, there's an imperative to penetrate the underlying you know, structural cause or ideological foundation of our experiences and more a kind of call, I would say, in his work to expand and even intentionally cultivate certain changes or even flexibilities in our mode of responding to the things that come upon us in our own lives. And arguably for my work, 
in what we read. So to me, this strikes me as kind of an opportunity to think about work in the humanities, uh, which has, after all, carries with it a history of making claims for its distinctive ability to speak to the texture of human experience, let's say. And to pick that up and try and, I would say, develop and even revive modes of criticism <coughs> which would focus on the specificity of one person's engagement with the text or what a particular text might make possible for a reader, which is a different kind of question than locating the underlying sort of um, meaning or structure of that text. It's more about expanding and kind of cultivating an aptitude to respond creatively and even um, intentionally to, to text. So I, this is sort of what I'm interested in doing as a critic, um, is sort of purposefully cultivating what I might call an angled use of a text, where I pick up a text to discuss something that I feel needs discussing, rather than in some ways to feel beholden to the idea that it's going to be explicated ultimately by its resituation and some logic of its own time. Now, I do want ultimately to develop this argument in relationship to naturalism, but I am also working on it at the moment in relationship to two other projects, two essays that I wanted to mention, just to give you a sense of what, I, what this would actually mean in practice. One is a piece that's about Emerson's attempts to find a way to use and engage the world, to make it handleable. And he speaks in quite famously in one essay about uh, the unhandsome quality of our lives being that everything slips through our hands. So this idea of a yearning to be able to handle, uh, to touch and hold on to life in some ways, quite urgent to Emerson. Um, but he turns to do it mostly through a very strange combination of abstract and concrete language. Um, concrete but chopped up into such little pieces that it, it's, it's strangely, I wouldn't say illegible, but it, it's hard to say it depicts life in a clear way. Um, what I'm kind of interested in is how there's a violence that comes out of Emerson's writing from both this kind of deep urge to find a way to sort of grapple or hold on to experience and the inability to find language that helps them actually do that satisfactorily. Now, a lot of previous critics have written about a kind of violence in Emerson, which they attribute, for instance, to American ideologies of a kind of imperial self uh, driven to control the world, dominate it, and make it over into one's own image. And it's a, you can see that there's an overlap here, but what I want to emphasize is not, oh, so Emerson's an instance of this kind of ideological truth, but rather, Look at how his work portrays in a kind of painful uh, and stark way um, that, a kind of, that kind of violence emerges from a mind that's unable to actually take hold of anything. That domination comes from basically, I think, a profound helplessness in Emerson. That I'm I should. think we should take the next example. Okay, I was going to go to the next example, but I can stop here. That's probably fine. I'm just looking at the class. Next one's about sentimentalism. So. <laughs> and greed. <laughs> okay, so I think my project kind of picks up a little bit. I hadn't noticed this before, but um, on what Theo was talking about in terms of avoiding sort of a reductionist approach to finding the essence of something, to taking an approach that is trying to actually um, add dimension and, and sort of yeah, sort of um, create and expand the conversation. So um, my project um, looks at um, looks at how we can design technologies that help people reflect upon their past as a means of supporting positive health-related behaviors in the future. So for example, increased physical activity or healthy eating practices. So the quantified self movement um, has gained tremendous momentum. How many people have a Fitbit or other kind of activity monitor? Yes, OK. Um, so journalists have covered this movement extensively. And um, there are people who are sort of explicitly uh, participate in the movement and others who are implicitly included. Um, and this movement has been studied by researchers in disciplines as diverse as sociology and computer science. Um, so the quantified self-movement is a label given to the use of devices and apps 
um, to measure information, quantifiable information, about our behaviors and our bodies. One major goal of these technologies is supporting self-understanding. So quantified self-researchers explore how seeing quantitative visualizations of our data, so graphs and charts, for example, um, of what we are doing, can help us to better understand what it is we do and make changes for the better. So like I mentioned, the Fitbits are one canonical example of tools that help us monitor how many steps we're taking, the calories we're burning, and then receive feedback on how well we're progressing towards our goals. So my work questions what's lost with this quantified self-conception of behavior monitoring. And in particular, I seek to go beyond behavior monitoring as something that we're striving for to experience monitoring or experience reflection, a perspective <coughs> shift which I argue can help us to engage in a wider and more nuanced analysis of the elements of one's past that technology can help people to monitor and reflect upon. So design in my work is about creating innovative software tools that support richer kinds of understanding. So I take a human-centered approach to design that privileges the values, hopes, needs, desires, aspirations of people throughout the process of envisioning and creating new technologies. And I particularly focus on low socioeconomic status populations um, and trying to design these kinds of tools to help them overcome barriers to wellness that they might face. So I seek to go beyond the creation of tools that provide standard visualizations of quantitative trends of objective data and I'm not saying that that work is bad, um, should be stopped. Um, I think it has um, been important and continues to be an, an important way of helping people to um, gain uh, knowledge. Um, but it represents a very narrow view of the potential design space of technologies that can help people reflect upon their experience. So while qu quantified self work has focused on self-understanding, my goal is to broaden the way self-understanding has been conceptualized. So, for example, I'm exploring how to design tools that support reflection on subjective dimensions of our health-related experience. In particular, I'm focusing on felt experience, so the emotional, sensorial, visceral, spatio-temporal qualities of an experience, not just that I did it or I did it for this amount of time. Um, and so this means um, going beyond the design of tools that facilitate an intellectual understanding and awareness of the fact that, for example, I played in the park yesterday with my child for 30 minutes, to reflecting upon the emotional and visceral qualities of that experience. So for example, such a tool might help people to reflect upon the question, how did it feel to be running around in a park with my daughter on a crisp fall day? The answers might be invigorating, amusing, frustrating, brisk, windy, heart pounding, or perhaps I felt proud, or my child felt proud that she was able to accomplish something new. So the question then becomes, what can we help people understand about these different characters, uh, about this sort of nuanced character of their experience that might propel them towards healthy behaviors in the future? So it's all sort of well and good to think about, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could just reflect on our experience? Um, and, and that can be helpful in and of itself, but as someone who's interested in actually um, trying to contribute to um, the reduction of health uh, disparities, um, I'm also interested in sort of what ne what's next. So why do I think that this approach might be beneficial? Why consider designing technology that encourages this kind of reflection upon felt experience? Um, well, I want to explore how designing such tools can yield various kinds of benefits, two of which I'll briefly mention. First, um, I want to explore how designing for this richer reflection on experience can help people to, de to develop um, important socio-emotional and cognitive resources. So for example, in the past, I've designed technologies that help um, community residents to share their stories about how they have overcome barriers to healthy eating um, through um, photos, digital photos, through audio stories that they share on their cell phones and that are visualized in interactive um, displays in community centers. Um, and these kinds of tools, um, through my evaluations, we found have helped to inspire a sense of hope, 
um, have triggered feelings of inspiration, um, a sense of togetherness, <coughs> I'm not alone in this. Um, and a large part of how these sort of positive emotions were invoked was the sort of um, fact that the content that was shared um, had um, very sort of, um, uh, the qualities of it were emotional. So people were sharing like, what it really felt like to, you know, again and again experience um, uh, fast food options and then finally be able to make a decision about how they can eat healthier at the local McDonald's. Um, or one woman shared a story about how um, it felt to um, remove 50 pounds from her body. She says she doesn't say that she lost it because if she lost it, she might find it again. Um, and so, like, yeah, sort of, uh, sort of studying how um, that kind of um, evocative content can be beneficial. Um, something else I'm interested in drawing upon is positive psychology research on um, affect and reflection on positive passive experiences. So previous work has showed that when people richly reflect on their past experiences, so not just thinking, oh right, I, I was active yesterday, but when they think about all of these different dimensions that I've been talking about, um, it leads to an increase in positive affect. So they become hopeful, interested, um, all sorts of other kinds of positive emotions. And the experience of these positive emotions primes people to be able to do um, important things um, cognitively. So for example, it helps people be more likely to be able to step back from a problem and creatively imagine how to overcome challenges. So this is why when, um, you know, if you're doing class activities or um, you're in brainstorming sessions, um, getting people in a good mood is really important because they can think more creatively and have more hope that they're actually going to succeed. So tomorrow I plan to bring chocolate to my class um, from doing a brainstorming session. Um, yes, you can come to my class. Um, so, um, and sort of, you can imagine that when you're trying to help people to think about their future, um, putting them in this kind of positive mindset um, as they begin to reflect on what's possible is important, particularly when you're working in contexts where there are a lot of barriers. So the second thing, which I'll quickly say, I see you, your body language. Um, so, uh, um, second, I argue that taking this approach to design may be a way of facilitating increased engagement with health technology. So one of the key limitations of this proliferation of devices and applications for health monitoring is that people find them really cool at the beginning and then they stop using them. Um, and so I'm exploring how if we design tools that privilege this diversity of human values and dimensions that make up experience, that we might be able to create tools that people actually want to use for longer because they resonate on a deeper level. I'm pulling out my phone because my notes are on my phone, not because I'm just like texting. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be cool. And, yeah, also kind of impolite. Um, all right, so so my name is Julian Smith. Uh, I hadn't realized, I think, until this moment that the three of us are all sort of engaging in this like tension between the qualitative and the quantitative and formalism and non-formalism. And maybe this is obvious to you, but it wasn't to me until just now. Um, so, so that's going to be a theme in my talk as well. So I chose three images um, to show you today. Um, each of these three images has something in common. Um, and that commonality is that a, a procedural or formal system played a significant role in the creation of what you're looking at. Um, so on the left, uh, this is a screenshot from a game called Secret Habitat. Uh, by a mysterious internet artist who goes only by the name Strange Think. No one knows who this person is. Maybe it's multiple people. We don't really know. They live on the internet somewhere. Um, and Secret Habitat uh, is a computer-generated environment that players can walk around. Um, it contains a computer-generated set of art galleries uh, that you can explore. And each of these art galleries contains thematically similar, or designed to be thematically similar, um, computer-generated art and music inside them that you can walk around and experience as you go. And each room of each gallery is very clearly containing art that's produced by the same kind of algorithm because they're sort of stylistically similar, like there's obvious thematic <coughs> connection, like it's, it's by the same artist, I guess. Um, and, but then each gallery also feels distinct from another. Um, 
so I, I strongly encourage people to download and play it because it's a, a fascinating aesthetic experience to have. Um, the above right image, uh, this is uh, the book 100,000 Billion Poems by Raymond Cano. Uh, this was uh, created as part of the Alipo movement of poetry, which brought together mathematicians and poets. Um, this is a procedurally generated poetry book where the reader is invited to cut along the dotted lines uh, on each page and then piece together poems as they see fit by turning the different strips of paper to different areas. And so combinatorially you come up with, I mean, I don't think it's actually 100,000 billion poems, but it's some like very large number um, that I think we can give them poetic license for saying <laughs> uh, is that big. Um, the final image on this slide is a quilt that I created myself, actually, um, but was designed by a computer program that I wrote. Uh, so this is a quilt called Collaboration. Uh, the computer program that designed the layout and the colors uh, is responsible for figuring out exactly where all the pieces go and how to put them together and what order to sew what pieces uh, together. Um, and then I spent a weekend uh, being a, a slave to my my computer, uh, which was a harsh mistress, and <laughs> informed me that I should do some things that are actually kind of difficult, um, it turns out. Uh, but but it's, it's sharing this sort of idea of like there's a formal um, process that's, that's telling me what this quilt should be uh, that, that I then create. Um, so my work specifically looks uh, largely in the domains of games and craft. Um, which may feel different from each other in some ways, but to me, um, they're interesting together for a variety of reasons. They have a strong cultural prominence, right? Games are um, a significant part of our world at this point. 99% of teenage boys, 94% of teenage girls play games. Um, the average, yeah. The average age of someone who plays games is hovering somewhere around the 40s at this point. Um, you know, with varying amounts of time that we actually put into it, right? Like, I don't have the 20 hours that I used to, um, <laughs> but I, I play. <laughs> um, so there's a, a strong cultural prominence uh, for games and as well for craft, and these have very different demographics as well. So fiber arts and traditional craft and hobbyist communities is predominantly women. Um, you know, like a, a quilting convention that I went to had 99% women at it. Um, gaming conventions that I go to tend to have somewhere closer than 90% men at them, so they're sort of demographically spread. Um, I think there's something very interesting about the, the creative and aesthetic nature of them, this sort of blending of, the te of technology and the arts. Um, and they, have a, they share a very playful sort of entertainment-oriented focus where you sort of you play with craft kits in a very similar way that you play with games. Um, so specifically my project is an analysis of generative systems, um, mostly within these domains, although also occasionally looking outside of them to, to other areas that have either inspired it or have uh, a lot of analog with it. Um, my work is based in some archival research that I did at the Strong Museum of Play, um, some interviews that I plan to be doing over the coming year with creators of generative systems, um, like people who make these kinds of weird things. Um, and doing some source code level or rule book level analysis of these formal systems and the analysis of generated artifacts. Um, and there's a few ways that this work that I'm doing intersects with design. So, so one of the questions I have is what are the theories of the design process that get embodied into these formal systems? Um, and, and what does that sort of say about what the system is going to be able to create and, and what the creator of the system feels that design is, right? Is design um, sort of a, a random or heuristically guided composition of a bunch of different pieces towards a purpose, which is sort of this definition that, um, that Charlie and, and Matthias have both uh, pulled from a little bit? Um, is it something that's creatively inspired? You know, can, can we formalize the concept of a muse, right? Like the, the, the person that we, or like this, this entity, right, that, that provides us with inspiration? Um, I'm interested in what the theories of the product are that's actually being created by these generative systems. Um, you know, what was I thinking as, as a fiber artist, right, when I created this, this program that creates quilts about what the definition of a quilt is, right? Like, on some level, this, this formal program is saying, like, this is what a quilt is, right? And these are the only kinds of quilts that my system will be able to create. Um, I'm interested in the relationship, uh, as, as Charlie was alluding to, between the formal system and the human. 
Um, and I'm interested in this in two ways. Um, one is, is the human creator of a formal system, what is sort of the artistic relationship that they share. Um, there are some people who've created, uh, like Harold Cohen created a, a robot artist called Aaron. Um, and Aaron is, is a robot that will come out, like conceptualize paintings and then actually like physically paint them on a large canvas, like this complicated stuff that like makes the paint go. Um, and Harold Cohen would say that Aaron is, is the creator, right? Aaron creates things that he, as the creator of the system, is, is surprised by and finds novel, and, and so he feels that this robot is an artist in some sense, right? Uh, whereas other people may say, like, no, I am attempting to express my art through, um, through this system that I designed myself. Um, and then I'm interested in how humans who either interact with or interpret what the system has created react to the fact that it is computer created or formally created in some ways. So um, say what you will about gamers, they are more than willing to share their opinions on a wide variety of topics related to games. Um, and, and in the Dungeons and Dragons fan community, there's, there's numerous articles that I've found where people talk about you know, how do they feel that the, the monsters that they're fighting against are randomly generated, right? Like <laughs> at what point is that randomness not interesting anymore and they need some other layer that sits on top of it. Um, so I want to give a little bit of time, uh, but I guess I'll, I'll close by saying sort of the, I've been talking about this sort of like very formal definition of design and very quantitative approach, but like Andrea, I feel like one of the most interesting things that comes out from this kind of work is being able to look very explicitly at what we lose in the formalization. Right? So when we build um, models of synthesis from models of analysis, we lose something on the way, right? What, what some people may sort of call the, the creative soul of a piece. Um, and, and we lose this sort of romanticism of creativity. And so I'm interested in seeing sort of gaps within that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such interesting <coughs> projects. We have a very few minutes left uh, to hear from you, and I hope that we will hear from you at least briefly. We are at the beginning of, uh, at the really at the very beginning of a year-long ongoing conversation in which we will watch these projects develop and acquire shape, and you will continue to have windows into these projects as. Um, as they develop. Um, I am struck just sitting here today, and I've been part of these, uh, these presentations when we met in closed group, by the unlikely cross-disciplinary connections, and, um, and how fruitful that is. How f even it's thematically interesting, too, because we're talking about design and accident. And, but when you put minds together and you throw a word, there's a, it's always a conceit, it's always a construct, but it is shaping, um, I think, the individual works and the ways in which we're thinking. I mean, just listening here, I was thinking about temporality and how that keeps coming out, intentionality and affect. Um, almost everybody talked about uh, rules versus whatever the accident, let's say, or subversions, disruptions, rebellions, design and social action. I mean, maybe we all start there and then we build whatever we do around that. So, um, and, and also underlying meanings and um, how they open up new possibilities. A lot of conversation about futurity. So uh, just, you know, those were some of my free associations. Um, in the few minutes we have left, I'm just gonna open it to those of you who are here and see if you have any specific questions or just observations that you want to share. And Chris, it's yours. I have a follow-up on that, actually. So I heard a lot of those themes, too, and I like the way that you're referencing each other. I know it's quite early, so the answer to this question uh, may be no. But I'm interested in whether any of you can point to moments already in this project where you were working through a concept, an idea, or a question from your disciplinary or experiential lens, and a conversation or a moment or something somebody else said in the group led you to think about it differently. Has anybody had a moment like that? I have one. Yeah. And it would be cool that was not with us, we sit today. Uh, we brought up the idea of workmanship of certainty and workmanship of risk. Mm -hmm. And it crystallized a very important point in my thinking. Uh, because 
a lot of people in my discipline think of the actual software developers almost as monkeys at the keyboard. And I've been rebelling against this for about 30 years. And it gave me the understanding that, that, the, that the word to use with them is every single statement that a programmer writes down is workmanship of risk. And every one of those I risks... I think you should define humans. it, Matthias. Oh, a workmanship of, of certainty is when you are producing this model. There is almost nothing that can go wrong. We have a little stamp, it stamps out this bottle, and it looks the same. All these bottles look the same. If you craft this table, or if you craft, design a home, and you bring in workmen to execute your design for your... Just a few of those work craftsmen mess up, don't design, then your home doesn't look what you imagine it look like. That's workmanship of risk. All art is risky. And it has to go all the way down. From, from, from the person who has this big conception all the way down to all the participants to contribute. So I've been using the slogan that even programmers design, which has given me some, gotten me some ridicule in my community. Now I can say workmanship at risk, of risk. And actually, it is not just a, a change of terminology. It really is a change of perspective. It is I like this very much. This conceptually, such an interesting thing. I'm going to point to you, Liz, because I know you So in, in discussions around this calculable body or this non-quantified body, there's been a lot of resistance in the sense of people talking about um, the way in which those sorts of design elements allow surveillance and you know, top-down and risk insurance companies in some ways. You know? And I would thought that would be sort of doubled or tripled in the population you're talking about, where you're talking about mar already marginalized people potentially um, you know, sort of attaching themselves into this network of information, even if it becomes emotional or qualitative rather than highly clinical. Is that something that worries you? Yeah, so I'm really interested in this question, and so <coughs> two things. One is a next project that I really want to do is looking at um, digital workplace um, health interventions um, for low-wage workers, mm -hmm. um, because I think that touches on this a yeah. lot, um, you know, sort of all of the incentives that work uh, employers provide for you to sort of give them all this data about like, your, <laughs> yourself and how well you're complying with what you should be doing to live healthy on the other side. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. So, in my work, I haven't encountered much resistance because I think I mentioned I take this human-centered approach to design. So, all of the tools that I create are co-designed and co-built mm -hmm. really with the communities that they're being designed for. Um, so they, throughout the process, have a say in how they feel like these things should be created. Um, and the, they're sort of, the goal is that they're owned by the communities and um, the, you know, the, the families that we give them to are, yeah, that they're the owners and that they have a really clear picture of who is getting the data, who the data is shared with, so I think it's been really useful. But it's, yeah, it's such a huge issue and I think in some of the, these are, all the tools that I design are sort of used only by lay people when we start talking about systems where you're sort of transferring data to healthcare providers or yeah, it's going outside of the community, then yeah, those issues certainly. No way. Any final words from any of you on so um, I hope you will uh, come again and encourage your colleagues to uh, attend these presentations where um, I mean I always find just listening to my colleagues develop their projects, how much it sparks my imagination and influences my own work. I think it's just a critical thing that the Humanities Center offers, and I do really want to encourage you to encourage others um, to attend these and the work faculty works in progress as well. While I have you, and I'm reminded, especially uh, Liz, that your project is so exciting, um, to encourage you to come to the next Humanities Center event which is Thursday, November 19th, um, and that is what time? Oh, 4.40. Uh, Roya Hakakian, who um, uh, wrote a beautiful memoir that, um, that I read uh, about growing up in revolutionary Iran and the hopes that that revolution initially had for everybody and the fate of that revolution. 
Um, she will be speaking about what Jewish life in 20th century Iran reveals about Iran today. Um, I can't imagine a more timely uh, topic. And she's an eloquent writer, a journalist, um, and a lovely person. So uh, 